Okay, now let's get this show on the road. The story I want to tell you today is about a 15-year-old girl whose gruesome death on New Year's Eve left behind a mystery that had haunted her family for over two decades. It also left one man convicted of the girl's death that spent 18 years in prison for a crime he never committed. This case proved that even the tiniest little detail in the right hands can wind up holding the key to justice. This is the story of Małgorzata Kwiatkowska and Tomek Komenda. On the night of December 31st, 1996, the 15-year-old Małgosia was so excited. Her parents finally let her attend a New Year's Eve party at the local club with her friends and even allowed her to stay out later than her usual curfew. Her little hometown in western Poland, Miłoszyce, was certainly not considered a dangerous place, on the contrary being a very quiet, rather family-oriented area. The parents felt reassured Małgosia would be safe, she will have lots of fun and return around 2am, as they agreed. She was more than eager to leave for the party that night, all dressed up in a beautiful black dress, black tights, cute white socks and black boots. Her parents couldn't miss the opportunity to capture the moment and took a photo of her, all happy and smiling. And then she left. She was never meant to return home. Although Małgosia wasn't of legal age, she did drink that night. According to witnesses, just one beer and half a glass of champagne that theoretically couldn't make her extremely intoxicated, tipsy at most. However, Witness also testified she was last seen around midnight, outside of the club, and it seemed like she was heavily drunk. To the point where she couldn't walk properly, which was rather strange after drinking that amount of alcohol. This was more serious and definitely concerning. Then, as one of the witnesses points out, a man was seen walking up to her, introducing himself as Irek, claiming to be her brother. The man even seemed to be angry that she got so drunk, stating that he will take his sister home. The last sighting was of Małgosia being led away from the club by two or three men, one of whom was her alleged brother. There was one problem. Małgosia was an only child. The following day, on the first day of the new year, instead of celebrating a new beginning and making resolutions, people made a gruesome discovery. Małgorzata's body was found at 1 p.m. on January 1st, 1997, just a couple dozen meters away from the club, hidden between the properties, left on the snowy ground, leaning on the wall of a shed. Massive amounts of blood tainted snow around her naked frame. The only piece of clothing left on her were the white socks with very distinctive red stripes. She was brutally raped, beaten, with scratches and visible bite marks on her body. The autopsy report said that she did not die immediately after the incident. The perpetrators left her to death in freezing cold. It was negative 18 degrees that night. And she was dying in agony for several hours. The search for her murderers had begun. Unfortunately, the police messed up royally and I am inclined to share the disaster with you. Cause let's be real here, none of you true crime nerds will expect a happy ending from a story I've got for you. It's the year 2000, early morning hours. A 23-year-old Tomek Komenda and his whole family are still sound asleep in their small apartment in Wrocław when someone starts banging on the front door. Tomek's mom, still a little drowsy and quite annoyed at the unannounced visitor, walks up to the door and opens it. Then, all hell breaks loose. Several police officers barge into the flat, immediately rushing to Tomek's room, aggressively waking him up and announcing that he's under arrest for the brutal rape and murder of Małgosia Kwiatkowska three years prior. The apartment is thoroughly searched for any evidence, but the police finds nothing. Moreover, at least 12 people confirmed Komenda's alibi for that night. Blood 
DNA samples and dental mold of Tomek and his brothers are taken to forensic analysis. Even though there is no real proof that any of them were anywhere near the crime scene in 1996. The results come back as inconclusive. But the prosecutor, Stanisław Ozimina, decides to interrogate Tomek and charge him with Małgorzata's murder. As we later find out, even though the prosecution did not have any hard evidence for Komenda's arrest, it was a singular tip to the police about his involvement that made them set their eyes on the young man. Dorota P., the neighbor of Komenda's grandmother, once saw a sketch of a possible suspect in the case being broadcasted in one of the TV shows about unsolved crimes in Poland and claimed that she recognized it as the grandson of her neighbor, Tomek Komenda. If you wonder why would the police base everything on this random lady's claims that she kinda recognized him, let me tell you why. Cause she a vengeful bitch. So here's the deal, there's a family slash neighbor feud history there. This lady would just come to Tomek's mom's place and literally drop her gremlin offspring there, treating Tomek's home like a free babysitting service. So Tomek's mom was finally done with her BS and said, okay, no, nah, take this thing somewhere else. Dorota just threw a tantrum, added some threats about destroying their family, promises of vengeance, etc, etc. She also had connections within the police force. Several of the police officers were known to frequent her parties, including some of the officers who ended up arresting and interrogating Tomek. <laughs> Komenda never confessed to committing the heinous crime in 1996, except for one single time during the interrogation by the police officers. As Tomek later revealed, he was brutally beaten during the interview and his confession was coerced with threats and violence. Quote, I confessed, but only because those who arrested me said that they have hard evidence. They also physically assaulted me to get the confession. They beat me so hard that I would have confessed to pretty much anything, even to shooting at the Pope. End quote. Even the supposed confession he gave didn't really make sense if you line it up with the circumstances and timing of the homicide. According to his quote-unquote confession, Komenda allegedly left his home in Wrocław and headed to Miłoszyce around 2 a.m. However, the timeline in the case files indicates that Małgosia would have already be dying after the rape around the same time. Moreover, the testimony suggests that Komenda left Wrocław at 2 a.m., took the only train and a bus to the nearby Gajkov and walked to Miłoszyce the rest of the way. Here's the problem. Based on the distance between those two locations, he would get to Miłoszyce at 5.30 a.m. At that time, Małgosia was already dead. From then on, the same investigators in charge of his case conveniently found multiple evidence of his guilt. Tomek's hair and scent were found on a hat left at the crime scene. The medical examiner also determined that the bite marks on Małgosia's body matched Tomek's dental molds, even though later it turned out they were not identical. Finally, the judge announced the sentence. 15 years in prison. Tomek tried to appeal the sentence, insisting on re-examining evidence that, in the opinion of defense, was mishandled. The appeal gave him a new sentence. 25 years in prison. What? As traumatizing as being charged with murder was, nothing could have prepared this man for what awaited him in prison. Komenda was tortured, assaulted and humiliated by prison mates multiple times, with no help from the guards. Out of desperation, he attempted to take his own life three times. It seemed like the family of Małgosia could finally get some closure. The perpetrator was being punished, right? Except it wasn't the person they were looking for. In 2016, the case was reopened after a shocking new evidence was discovered by Remigiusz Korejwo from Poland's Central Bureau of Investigation, who only coincidentally moved to Miłoszyce and took interest in the brutal crime from 1996. Korejwo, along with prosecutors Dariusz Sobieski and Robert Tomankiewicz, re-examined the case and evidence, finding multiple inconsistencies, negligence, and eventually a true suspect who seemed to have slipped through the initial investigation. 
Ireneusz M. was listed as one of the witnesses testifying right after the crime. When inquired about the victim, he confirmed he did see her at the party, describing that she was dancing, having fun, drinking. He also correctly identified her outfit, pointing out that he remembered her because of a very distinctive pair of white socks with a red stripe she had on. Here's the deal. Małgosia was wearing boots that covered the socks. So the only way Irek could have seen them would be if he took off the girl's shoes. Busted, you sad, pathetic piece of uh, ravioli. What did I ever do to you, dude? Korevo, Sobieski and Tomankiewicz immediately reported their findings and an arrest warrant was issued for Ireneusz M. and Norbert B., since both men were at the party in 1996, had no plausible alibi, and evidence points at them as the perpetrators. Irek was sentenced to 25 years in prison, but Norbert's trial is still ongoing. And unfortunately, he's not being held in prison until the sentence is announced. Tomek Komenda was acquitted from all charges and released from prison on March 15th, 2018, after spending there 6,540 days. Which is absolutely fiery piss of hell infuriating. The police suspects there could have been up to three perpetrators, which means one of them could be out there, and the other one is free until the sentence is in place. The investigators and Małgorzata's family still need every possible clue, and any legitimate witnesses to come forth. So if you know anything about the tragedy that happened on December 31st, 1996, please get in touch with the authorities. Every detail, even the tiniest one, can be crucial to solving this case. And give the family and friends the well overdue closure. You know what's even worse than the government in your country doing a crappy job at handling the pandemic? Uh, this. Okay, so we're in a shit spot with the virus right now. We need a solid plan to stop the madness. Suggestions? Yo, we can totally announce a stricter anti-abortion law now! Uh, yeah, that's literally the worst idea. People will start protest- Yes, now's our chance! No one can stop us! Result? Hordes and hordes of women absolutely pissed off, organizing massive protests and wanting to lynch the government. Yes, I am talking about Poland. And yes, I am definitely one of those pissed off women and would love to watch the parliament burn. Also, just a fun fact, but in 1672 an angry mob of Dutchmen ripped apart and ate their Prime Minister, John de Witt. Not suggesting we should do it, just saying we've got options. There should be no stigma on not wanting to go through with the pregnancy. No one should decide for the woman about her own body, and especially not a bunch of dudes with no trace of vagina and uterus whatsoever. I support the initiative to live the abortion ban in Poland. Instead, make it legal, safe and accessible to those in need. Otherwise, more women will have to risk their health and lives going through a possibly dangerous pregnancy, as well as in the so-called abortion underground, where a procedure or taking shady meds can end up in tragedy. If you're in Poland and currently in a tough situation like that, please know that you're not alone. Abortion Dream Team is an initiative that helps women get safe, legal abortion across the border, with financial support and no judgment. And oh boy, can I already hear the raging mob of internet trolls marching my way with pitchforks and opinions I did not ask for. To be clear, no one, absolutely no one is forcing you to get an abortion. If it's your body, it should be your choice exclusively and no one else's goddamn business. All I can say is, don't be a dick. Respect people's life choices if you want yours to be respected. Simple as that.